us who he is. Waymaker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. That's who he is. You know, in this scenario that we're looking at in, in the Hurt Locker series, which is going to be about probably five or six messages, I, I would imagine, because there, there are a lot of things to look at in here and not just the fact that we all hurt and we all do know that we, everyone hurts, that you don't leave this earth without some hurt in your life. You don't enter it without some. Every family has some. We all experience hurt in our life. And because of that, we have an enemy that tries to take advantage of that hurt. That's his most opportune moment to impress us that God is not who he says he is, that he doesn't care about us, that it's obvious that he doesn't protect us because we're hurting. And he's what I call the hurt whisperer. He whispers. He comes in those times of pain and darkness in our life, and he just whispers to us those accusations against God. And then, of course, Jesus is our hurt redeemer. He is the one who takes those hurts and uses those hurts to redeem our life and move in our life. So anyway, there's just a tremendous amount of information the Bible talks about and, and, and I think we all need in our life because uh, it, hurt and pain is just such a, a tremendous uh, outlet for, for God to speak into our life and, and for a defeat of the enemy. And I started last week sharing with you five emotional facts of life. Of course, facts of life means that we all suffer these. This is not just someone who seems to have some difficulty. These are five emotional facts of life. And the first one was life hurts. That we took the little poll, you know, how many of you have had something devastating happen in your life at some time? And so many hands went up. And then I said, just for interest, interest sake, how many of you have resolved those hurts in your life? And there was like three or four hands went up. And, and there's a good reason for that, and it's because most hurt and pain doesn't get resolved in our life. It just lays there, it festers, and thus the name of the series, The Hurt Locker. We put our pain in a locker that is in our heart, and I call it The Hurt Locker. doesn't have anything to do with the movie back in 2009, but it is a good concept for where we put our pain. We just, we just tuck it away in a locker deep inside our life, and it just stays there because unless you deal with it, it's going to remain there for the rest of your life and influencing and infecting everything, every relationship, every opportunity, everything in your life. Many times you might ask, why, you might ask, why did I feel that way? Or why did I say that? I don't, what's wrong with me? And it, Well, check your hurt locker. Uh, it's probably got some stuff that are, that are brimming out of it that, 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 that you're reflecting because that's what happened. Uh, uh, fact of, emotional fact of life number two was that, um, let me see here. Time, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, here it is. Number two, in our lives, unless we deal with pain properly, when it occurs, it accumulates within our hearts. So we have to, when, when pain happens in our life, if we deal with it properly, great. Everything's fine. If we don't, it accumulates in our life, and it goes into our hurt locker. And there were two really tremendous uh, unsettling realities concerning pain in our life. And number one is most of us don't know how to deal with pain. Uh, our parents don't know how to deal with pain. Even Christians don't know how to deal with pain. So what happens most of the time is because no one really can guide us through this, if our, pastors, if, if our parents could pastor us through this, if they knew how to deal with this, if they could help us, then great. That would be wonderful. But most of us don't have that opportunity. And so what do we do? We put it in our locker. Then we begin to avoid it. And we pretend it's not there or we act like it didn't happen or whatever uh, mechanism we might have in our life to try to get rid of it. That's just a, a really... A, um, a tragic, unfortunate reality of, of life that we do that. And then the second tragic, unfortunate reality of life is that time heals nothing. And I know we've heard it all of our life, time, uh, time heals everything. Well, I don't think so. I think time heals nothing. I think time takes us away from the emotional impact of the moment. You know, and you might get a little bit away from, from it, and it might not be quite as severe and, and as devastating to you, but it's not going away. Time doesn't make things go away. It just actually, I think, intensifies things. And I know many of you that have suffered many years in your life and you've had unfortunate things. You grew up with tremendous abuse 
or pain or hurt or feelings or all of those things. And, and, and you're, you know, 50, 60, 70, you, however old you are right now, that pain is just as real right now, if not more intensified than it was the moment it happened to you because it just doesn't go away. And unless it's dealt with properly, it continues just to pile up in our life and, uh, and become a, a, an instrument for the, for the devil to use to devastate our life, which brings fact, emotional fact of life three, and that is accumulated pain and unresolved problems compromise our mental health, our emotional health, our spiritual health, and our relational health. In other words, Pain that is piled up into our life compromises every part of our life. Our mental life, we get clouded uh, with feelings and thoughts, uh, depressions, distress, anxiety. All of these things begin to cloud the way we think about things and the way we feel about things. Of course, our relationship with God is always clouded up by these uh, hurts and pains in life because we wonder, where's God? Why didn't God do something about this? The devil is at every funeral asking the same question. If God loves you, why did this happen to you? The devil is at every uh, hospital room whispering in your ear saying, if God loved you, why doesn't he heal you? I thought God could do anything and he doesn't care about you. And he, I mean, at every opportune time of pain in life, it's the enemy that whispers to you to take advantage of the fact that God is not who he is and you can't trust God. So accumulated pain just uh, begins to undermine and compromise every bit of our life it, it must be dealt with. And then the fourth emotional reality of life or fact of life is that we all deal with pain in some way. Whether it's right or wrong, we, we all deal with pain in some way. And this is where we stopped last week, and I shared with you only one of, uh, of the examples from the Scripture about how uh, some of the famous Bible characters that we love that are tremendous, uh, tremendous people in the Word of God handle pain in some very wrong ways. Uh, pain is the 500-pound gorilla in the middle of everybody's room. You're going to deal with it one way or another. You're not going to just avoid it altogether. It's going to have to be dealt with. And I started by, last week by sharing with you about King David, who's everybody's favorite Bible character, or many people's favorite Bible character, and how... And the fact that he had a very dysfunctional life. He had a lot of pain in life. I know that he was a man after God's own heart. God called him, here's a man after my own heart. But he called him that because David was a tremendous worshiper and a tremendous repenter. If you're going to be a great sinner, you better be a really good repenter. And David, David was a tremendous sinner. I mean, he had lots of problems, guys, in, in our life. You would not want to live next door to David. He would have been a real problem in your neighborhood, and you wouldn't have felt safe and all of that kind of stuff. And I know that's hard to imagine about one of God's favorite characters in the Bible, but it just shows you how pain affects, affects life, and it affects everyone's life. David's life was very dysfunctional. He came from a very pain-filled family, dysfunctional to the core. You remember his dad, when, they, when, when Samuel came to anoint everybody, his dad didn't even call him in from the field. He was so, uh, he didn't even think of him. It, it was, I mean, he wasn't even a thought in his dad's mind about being the one that God could choose. The other seven brothers, he was the eighth son, the youngest son of Jesse. He was out in the fields, and Samuel had to say, don't you have any more sons? And Jesse said, oh, yeah, one more, but uh, it's not him. It couldn't be him. He's so singularly unimpressive, we didn't even bring him in. And so David was totally disrespected by his father. His father didn't believe in him at all. And then when his father sent him to the battlefield, you remember when Goliath was making all of his big demands, his dad sent him to the battlefield to check on his brothers and bring them some snacks. And when David got there, his brothers began to lamb blast him. His brothers looked at him and said, why are you up here? Oh, we know why you're up here. We know your wicked heart. Who's keeping those little few sheep dad entrusted to you? I mean, they just completely disrespecting their brother. They didn't, they didn't like him. They, they didn't trust him. And then when he killed Goliath and, and went into the palace to help Saul out, got hired by Saul to play music when Saul got all disturbed and make him, give him some peace in his life, uh, and the women began to sing this song that began to really upset Saul. The song was, Saul has slain his thousands and David has slain his tens of thousands. Uh, Saul, in a fit of jealous rage, 
took javelins and started throwing them at David. David's here playing the harp, trying to help this evil spirit settle down in King Saul's life. And Saul is throwing javelins at David. And David's having to dodge javelins and keep playing. I'm just telling you, David had a lot of things to be painful about in life. A lot of disrespect, a lot of people that didn't have any regard for his life at all. And so how did David try to handle? Well, let me just mention this. David didn't know how to handle pain in his life, and so no one in his family knew how to handle pain in life. The way David handled his pain was to medicate himself. And by medicating, I'm just simply meaning he uses some substance or some um, uh, opportunity in life to, to help him uh, avoid that pain for a, for a moment of time. Uh, for some, uh, it might be uh, drugs or uh, alcohol as a specific kind of drug, or it might be a uh, shopaholic, or it may be a gambler, an addicted gambler, or it, it could be a, an overeater. You know, people, tr- sometimes they just eat to try, and, and, or it could be any of those things. People that do crazy things, and they, per- they take risk in life because it boosts their adrenaline levels. They're, you know, they're just kind of uh, death junkies, you know. They just, anyway, all of, those, all of those things are ways that we medicate ourselves. David's way of medicating was sex. Uh, David was uh, David used sex as a medication in his life, and he had lots of problems with it. He had lots of babies, kids. He had 51 kids. Some of the Bible scholars say that David had 51 children in his life. He had eight wives that are mentioned in the Bible, uh, probably some more that aren't mentioned. They're just implied. He had many affairs. The most famous one was with Bathsheba. And, you know, Uriah, her husband, was gone. I won't go into all those details. But basically, David uh, arranged it so that uh, Uriah would be killed on the battlefield so that his affair with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, wouldn't look so bad and he could marry her and everything would be, you know, kind of under the table and everything would be going good. And, and, and so he, he used these opportunities and he used this in order to uh, have some momentary peace in his life and and to have some, some ease of that pain in his life. And this is a powerful draw. To medicate, to medicate your pain is a powerful draw in life. Because as long as you're on your drug, as long as you're using that medication, whatever it might be, you have temporarily escaped the, the, the pain and the hurt that you're feeling in life. But the hurt and pain... Uh, returns whenever you, when, you're, when your medication is gone. And why is that? Because it never has been dealt with. It's just been medicated. And it's not going away. It just goes right back in the hurt locker to show up again in life and, and for you to have to medicate again. So this is an exact wrong way to deal with pain. Some people medicate their pain. And then here's the second one. Uh, the second one is one of David's children by the name of Solomon. Now, I know you've heard of Solomon before because Solomon is a very famous person in the Bible. Solomon built the temple. Solomon was a tremendous, was tremendously used by God. But I want you to know that Solomon had his own sexual issues. Yeah, dad had sex problems and all the boys had them too and all the girls had them too. Solomon had 700 wives, 300 concubines. Now, I submit that's an issue in life. That's a problem. I mean, 300, you know, we might could handle three, 300, 400, that'd be okay. But I mean, tell you, when you get over three or 400 wives, that's going to be a real problem in life. I'm going to tell you that. That's a real issue in life. But he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He was the richest man in the history of the world. He needed to be with that many wives, didn't he? Right. I saw some of you guys getting excited about 700 wives. I just want to remind you, that means he has 700 mother-in-laws also. All right, just, just kind of put that in perspective. He built the greatest nation on the face of the earth, there's never been a man on this earth who could even rival Solomon. Solomon owned so much gold that, that silver lost all of its value. He built and did and built and did and built and did and built and did to motivate his pain through workaholism. Here's, I, I should have been giving you these blanks. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Tanya, why didn't you remind me, babe? I'm sorry. Let me show you. <laughs> These are what go in the blanks. I'm sorry. David medicated his pain. Solomon motivated his pain. To motivate means to give you a reason for it. 
And to give you a reason why Solomon was, a, was a, 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 an overworker and Solomon was a workaholic and an overachiever in life, he used this workaholism and this overachievement in life to medicate himself uh, to get over his pain. So instead of using alcohol or sex or eating or drugs or whatever it might be, Solomon just uh, uh, occupied himself with working all the time. And everything he did, he did in order to avoid uh, having those times in life where he might have to be alone or by himself or have some kind of quiet time. He just kept himself busy all the time. And what was Solomon's pain? What was Solomon trying to medicate here or, or to motivate here? Why was he trying to work all the time? Well, uh, one thing uh, is that Solomon was the second son of David and Bathsheba. I don't know if you know that, but that is who Solomon was. The first son that David and Bathsheba had was the one that was conceived during the affair. What happened to that son? He died. After seven days, that son died. David put on sackcloth and ashes and prayed and just went before the Lord and laid down and threw up the, sack, threw up the ashes. I mean, he, just, he just, uh, just did everything you could do to pray for the little fella to live. But after seven days, he died, and then when he died, David put on the happy suit and the clown outfit, and they had a big party and enjoyed it. And some of his friends looked at him and said, well, David, while you were, uh, you know, while, while, while he was laying there sick, you had, to, you had on the sackcloth and ashes, and now that, now that he's died, you put on the party, party clothes, and it's time to, you know, have a party about that. And David said, well, uh, the reason why is because when he was sick, there was a chance that he might be made well, but now that he's dead, uh, he can't come back to me, but I can go to him. This is one of the statements that, that make us believe that children, when they die, they go straight to heaven. Because David said, I can't bring my boy back to me, but I can go to him, implying that his boy was already in heaven when he was there. That's David. See, that's why he was a man after God's own heart. But the point is, here's Solomon now. Solomon is the second son born to Bathsheba. So he is the son of, of, a, of a marriage that started with an affair. Secondly, uh, David's father, I mean uh, Solomon's father, David, killed Solomon's mother's husband, Uriah, in order to be able to marry his mother. Let me see if I can say that one more time. Dave, Solomon's father, who is David, killed his mother, who was Bathsheba's husband, former husband, Uriah the Hittite, in order to marry his mom, and therefore his parents are uh, scandal-ridden. Yeah, this would have been front-page news on the National Enquirer. Yeah, you could have been in the grocery lines reading every week about Solomon. I'm sure the paparazzi would just follow him everywhere because he was the son of a scandal. Uh, also, uh, he watched his older brother Absalom try to take the kingdom away from his father, David, and try to kill his own father, David. This meant that Absalom many times had to make choices about who he was with and who he was for and how he felt about his own dad and about his own brother who were in combat over the kingdom that they all lived in. And then last but certainly not least, when it came time for David to die, David had to leave the kingdom to one of his sons. Well, it wasn't going to be Solomon because Solomon was born way down the line. He wasn't even close to the top. He didn't even stand in line for the throne. But because Bathsheba was so, was so um, assertive and, uh, and, and she had David's heart so closely, she, ma Mama Bathsheba, convinced David to give the kingdom to Solomon, their son. And so that's what David did. David gave the kingdom to Solomon, and you know what Solomon did? He killed the oldest brother so that there would be no question about who was supposed to be king. Uh, he had issues, right? He had some pain in life. And so in order, to, in order not to think about all of that kind of stuff, he just did and did and did and did and did and did some more. And he was the most industrious, the most productive person that has ever lived on this earth. As a matter of fact, Solomon wrote this about himself. 
There's a whole book filled with what Solomon wrote about himself during these times of his workaholism and overachievement in life. And look at what he said about himself in Ecclesiastes 2. So I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. I'm, I'm questioning that a little bit, but that's what he says. Um, Whatever my eyes, look, look, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. In other words, Solomon said, "Man, I enjoy working. I enjoyed all this labor I did. Whatever I saw, I did it. Whatever it looked like, I did it." I can build anything. I can do anything. And I love doing all of that because that's what makes my heart happy to be able to just work and work and work and work and just, just lose myself in all of this work that I have going on. And that's what makes my heart rejoice. But he doesn't end in verse 10. He goes on and he says, Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor in which I had toiled. And indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. And there was no profit under the sun. Solomon's own testimony about his own work and his own words were, it was making me happy at the time, but when I really look back at it, it just didn't profit me anything. I mean, it really was worthless in my life. So when you're in pain, one of the ways that you deal with pain is to distract yourself from the pain. You bury yourself in your phone. Man, you can't even get on an elevator nowadays if people aren't buried all up in their phones. Walk in the home, buried in the phone. No conversation. You guys are going to have trouble. You young people are going to have trouble with relationships in the future because you don't know how to talk to each other. You don't even know how to interact. You're going to be so socially inadequate because you live in a phone. You're going to have to get married through a text message or something. I, I get. But one of the ways that people distract themselves from their pain is to bury themselves in a distraction. Turn on the TV. Walk in the room, turn, in, turn on the TV. Some of you cannot walk into a room that's quiet. you got to turn on some noise. you got to sit there and listen to some music. you got to get in front of a computer screen and start playing games. you got to keep yourself busy all the time because when you stop and it gets quiet, that's when the ghosts show up, don't they? Those ghosts that want to talk to you about things in your past. When it's quiet. I mean, even as Christians, Christians can't be quiet before the Lord. Oh, they can do their quiet time, but they got to be busy doing something. They got to be filling out some kind of biblical form. They got to be doing a Bible crossword. They got to be answering questions. Out of the Bible. I mean, they have to have something. They can't even be quiet with God because to be quiet with God makes us nervous and anxious because we're afraid that God is going to bring up something we don't want to talk about. There's a big psychological deal going on now, and the word is used all the time, and it's the word boundaries. You don't violate people's boundaries. If you've got a, if you've got a boundary and, and, and you don't like for people to get close to you, and I come walking up and get close to you, and you, and you, and you back up like that, I've just violated your boundary. You don't feel comfortable with somebody that close. Well, that's a boundary. We have all kinds of boundaries. We have boundaries in things we talk about, think about, do, act. We have boundaries everywhere. There are books written on boundaries. You know something I believe about God? I don't believe God's read one of those books about boundaries. I don't think God even cares about our boundaries in our life. As a matter of fact, God will walk right up to you, put his finger in your bowl of cereal and just stir it around and say, hey, I'm God, I created you, you're mine, and I want to talk to you about this. So sit down and let's talk about this. This is hurting, you've been running, you've been hiding, you try to, you try to work late, build stuff, do things, watch TV, get in your phone, turn on music, play video games, you try to do anything but be quiet with me. Because when you get quiet with me, I'm going to go right to the issue. 
Because I don't know if you've noticed this about God. He doesn't small talk either. He doesn't say, you know, how's the weather this week? Or how many fish did you catch yesterday? Or, 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 or what kind of buck did you kill last week? I mean, no, God doesn't deal with that small talk junk. God goes straight to the issue, and whether, whether the issue is uh, abuse or anger or bitterness or betrayal or, or hurt, whatever that issue is, God goes straight to that issue, and God says, we're going to talk about this issue. And the silly thing about hiding from God is that we are hiding from our healer. We are hiding from the one who can heal our life. Because when God touches our life, our life heals. When God touches our life, it doesn't hurt. It heals. It hurts before he touches it. But when God touches our life, it heals. Look at, look at, look at what he says. This is in, in Matthew 11. This is Jesus talking. Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and I'm lowly of heart. That just means I'm humble. He says, look, I'm not a big blowhard. I'm not some big noisy, uh, angry person trying to hurt you. I'm meek. I'm under control. I'm lowly of heart. I'm humble. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. One of the things that we worry about when people start digging in our pain, no matter what our pain is, you're in pain because you grew up ugly, you know, had buck teeth and eyes that didn't look right and all that, and people just mocked you, Bucky the, te- you know, the beaver or what? I mean, they, they called you names and they, looked, they, they said you were ugly and, they, you know, your hair was nasty and all that. I mean, you know, you grew up with a lot of pain like that. Look, what was the greatest fear of your life when you were growing up with that pain? Wasn't it that somebody would start sticking their finger in it? Wasn't it that somebody start poking at it? They start mocking you and making fun of you and poking at you at the pain in your life. You couldn't do anything about the fact that you were gangly and couldn't gain weight and, you know, look like some kind of uh, a thermometer or something. I mean, you, you couldn't, I mean, you, all those freckles on your face, you couldn't do anything about that. The fact that you had to wear real big, thick glasses so you could see, you couldn't do anything about that. And, and, and when somebody would see that, they would poke that pain, poke that pain, poke that pain, poke that pain. And you wanted to avoid that at all costs. Let me tell you something. God does not poke at your pain. God does not stick his finger in your pain in order to hurt you and to make you feel bad. God says, look, I am gentle with you. I am, I am humble. I am, I am meek. I am gentle. I, I quoted this verse last week. This is out of Isaiah 42. Look at what he said. This is talking about Jesus. A bruised reed he will not break. What does that mean? A bruised reed is one of, it's like a, it's like a stalk that's sticking up and it's just barely hanging on. You know, it's just, it's just so, I mean, anything could make it break and, and, and fall off. Look at what it says about Jesus. Jesus said, I am so gentle with you. I'm so careful with you. I'm so tender with you that if, you're a, if you are a broken reed, if you are so torn up, you can't stand one more bad touch. When I touch you, it's going to be so gentle that it won't even break a broken reed. And that smoldering flax, just one little touch, and it's gone. And I'm going to touch you so gently that it's not even going to put out that flax that would be up there. That's how gentle. Jesus says, look, trust me, that's how gentle I am with you. Most shattered, broken people in the world Don't want someone to deal roughly or disrespectfully with them. And Jesus says, I understand, and I will touch you gently, and you will heal. And listen to this. Jesus is the only one who can heal the pains of your past. I can't do it. Your husband can't do it. Your wife can't do it. The counselor can't do it. Drugs can't do it. Workaholism can't do it. The only one who can heal the hurts from your past is God. 
So you're going to need to deal with God. You can't medicate. David medicated his hurts. Solomon motivated his hurts. What did Absalom do? One other kind. Absalom meditated his pain. Not medicated, meditated. By meditating, I just simply mean he just thought about it all the time. You know, there's some people like this, right? That they get hurt, and when they get hurt, what do they do? They get mad, right? Get angry. Get bitter on the inside. Cynical. Hurt. Deep. deep. They don't talk about it. They don't do it. They just sit around and sulk over it. And just roll it around in their mind and just get more and more angry all the time. Well, what did Absalom, what kind of pain did Absalom have in his life? Well, Absalom's older brother was a half-brother by the name of Amnon. Absalom's real sister from the same mama was named Tamar. That's the only girl that is listed in the family of David in the Bible. Some more daughters are implied, but this is the only one that's mentioned by name. And so Amnon, the half-brother, decides that he loves Tamar, his stepsister. And so Amnon, in a fit of lust and passion and whatever else you want to call it in uh, criminal activity, rapes Tamar. And guess what dad does about it? Nothing. Two years pass by. Two years pass by. David does not say a word about it. David does nothing to Amnon. David, does, David doesn't even ask any questions, and he says nothing. And all of those two years, here's Absalom. He's just rolling it around, rolling it around, rolling it around in, it, in his heart, rolling around in his mind, just getting more and more anger. After two years of David doing nothing, Absalom kills Amnon, his brother, for raping his sister. And then he runs for his life. And he runs to a land in, in Israel that was ruled by his maternal grandfather, by Bathsheba's daddy. He's the kind of king over a certain section there. And Absalom runs to that section to hide out from David. And guess what David did? Nothing. He didn't pursue him. He didn't send for him. He didn't talk to him. He didn't talk about him. He was completely silenced. For three years, three years, Absalom sits in a kingdom having killed his half-brother Amnon and his dad, who is the king over all the land, says nothing, does nothing, says nothing to him and does nothing about it. Finally, some men from the kingdom arrange it where Absalom could, would be able to come back, you know, and maybe face the music and face it. And so they, they coerce him and he finally comes back to the kingdom where David, his father, is. And guess what David does then? Nothing. For two more years, Absalom sits in the kingdom. Now it's been seven years since the event happened, and David has not even talked to his son, never called him in, never said a word to him, never did anything about all of that. And Absalom just festered and festered and angered and festered and festered over all of that what had happened and what didn't happen, thinking, I'm sure, my father doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about what happens in our family. He doesn't respect me. He doesn't have any honor in me. And finally, he snaps, and Absalom begins to overtly take the kingdom away from his own father. He begins to talk about his dad at the gates of the city. He begins to start an insurrection among people that are close to David obviously taking the kingdom from his own dad. He had meditated for seven years about this thing. He had rolled it over in his mind. He had planned. He had schemed. He had connived. It just ate him up. It was bitterness, and it was wrath, and it was hostility on the inside of him. And after seven years, he puts his plan into motion, and he tries to take the kingdom from his own father. You know, some people get hurt and they get angry and they just stew on it and they get cynical and angry and hate-filled. But when you get hurt, you have to make a choice. You have to deal with it. 
good or bad, whatever direct you, you, you have to deal with that pain. And if you don't deal with that pain, that pain is going to stay on the inside of you and that pain is going to continue to hurt you and not only hurt you, it's going to hurt your family. Because people who are hurt with pain hurt their families. You think about it. That pain is on the inside of you and in a trigger it just pops out and it creates dysfunction among your parents. I mean, think about holidays. A lot of people don't not, not only uh, use one of these ways to medicate themselves or to, or to deal with pain, they use two ways. Like, like these people that are angry drunks, as an example. The drunker they get, the more angry they get. These are people that are most likely meditators. That's why they're so mad and medicators because they use alcohol to get rid of their problem. Every family event you have, they cause pain because they show up medicated. And the motivators are never there. They hurt your family because they're never there. They're always working somewhere. Well, he would have come, but he had to be... And the family's hurt because of people can't deal with pain. And then the meditators, the meditators hurt families because they're always angry, always hostile, always griping and grouching about everybody in the family because they're mad. Because they're filled with pain in their life. Emotional fact of life number five. I'm already six minutes over, so I've already blown it, so just hang in there. Emotional fact of life number five. We'll give it quickly. The only way to stop the hurt and totally resolve it is to turn it toward God. Let me say it again. I can put it up on the screen. There it is. Thank you, Isaac, my man. The only way to stop the hurt and totally resolve it is to turn it toward God. You must bring it into the light. You must empty it out of that hurt locker. You got to open up that hurt locker and you got to empty that thing out. Matthew 5, verse 4. This is what Jesus said, and I know you got it. I know you, I know you can uh, remember it because we've said it so many times. This is one of the Beatitudes. Look at what it says. Jesus said this Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, I know that many of you are probably thinking, well, I know that's what that says, but I know a lot of people that are mourning that are not being comforted in life. Well, let me just kind of expose the thought for just a second about mourning, and, and, I, and, and, and we'll quit on this. But It doesn't say, that verse doesn't say, blessed are those that moan, for they shall be comforted. You see that? It says, blessed are you when you mourn. To moan means to bellyache, gripe, uh, complain. doesn't say that I get comfort whenever I gripe about it, bellyache about it, and complain about it. It says, when I mourn. Mourn is legitimate grief. That's what the word means, to legitimately grieve. And what is Jesus saying there? Jesus is saying, when you have legitimate grief, if you will turn that legitimate grief toward me, I will hear what you say, I will listen to what you say, and I will move with comfort in your life to comfort you with strength. The word comfort means with strength. So that verse is just saying, look, if you will turn your pain toward me and don't think that God doesn't know what pain you're talking about and don't think that you're going to shock him and surprise him because he already knows you. He knows everything about you. And you can't do anything that will make him not love you in life. No matter what you do, you cannot make God stop loving you. You can reject God. You can walk away from God. You can go to hell if you choose to. But you're going to go to hell with him loving you all the way to hell. Because he loves you. He's done everything to provide for you. He will not reject you. I know the enemy says, You're, you've, you've gone too far. You've done too much. God wouldn't love you. God doesn't want you. You should have never done. I mean, the enemy has told you all of those lies, but God says, look, if you will turn your mourning, your pain toward me, 
I'm going to move in your life with strength to comfort you, to relieve you of that strength in life. So the first thing that you have to do, there are three, three things real quick. Let me just give them to you so you can put them in the blank. Honesty before God. You got you to be clean. You got to be honest about it. You got to tell him the truth. These are three essential requirements for coming clean with God. Get honest with him. Put it before him. Honestly tell him what's going on. Second, you have a responsibility to God, which just means I take responsibility for my pain, for my hurt. Uh, Daddy did it. Uh, uh, Bubba did it. Uh, Mama did it. Uh, Sissy did it. Uh, somebody did this. Somebody did that. Somebody that. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're responsible for your own life. Life is not what happens to you. Life is how you respond to what happens to you. Two prisoners sitting in a prison cell looking out in a, on a moonlit night. One prisoner sees bars. The other prisoner sees stars. It's a matter of your perspective. You can choose to see bars or you can choose to see stars, but you are responsible for the choice that you make. It's not mama, daddy, bubby. It, it, it. And I know, look, I know I'm talking to some people that probably have been hurt by some of the people in their life that ought to be the biggest blessing to them. You have been hurt by them and, and damaged by them. And it, it would be astounding if any of us knew exactly what happened to you in life. But I'm just saying that in order to be healed, we have to turn that to God and put it in the light and tell Him about it and talk to Him about it and let Him talk back to us and reveal it to Him and be honest and be open and talk about it. No matter whether you want to talk about it or not, no matter how painful it is or not, talk to Him about it and expose it to Him and then take responsibility for what happens in your own life because you are the one that makes the choice about what happens in your own life. And it's up to you to make the choice. God will help you, but it's still up to you to make the choice. And then the hardest one that we have to do is forgive. And we'll hit it quick. Mercy from God for me and for those who have hurt me. Now listen. In the area of hurt, in the area of hurt, the most important factor for your healing is forgiveness. And I'm telling you, I have been hurt. I know if we could sit down and compare hurts, you know, you, you, know, you probably, some of you have been hurt more than me, but I'm telling you, I've been hurt a lot in life. Deep, deep stuff. So I'm not talking from some ivory tower up here somewhere that I don't know how it feels. I'm telling you, here's the truth. In order to be healed, you must forgive. The, the, the medicine is in the forgiveness. You hear me? The medicine that you need is in the forgiveness. You don't give it, you don't get the medicine. Forgiveness is the medicine. Whatever they did. Oh, I know it's hard. I, I, I can feel you right now, you know. I feel you what you're saying. You know, Luke, in Luke chapter 6, and this is a hard verse to read to you, but I'm going to read it, and then we, we, I'm going to quit pestering you today. Um, we look at the hurt whisperer next. Believe me, that enemy that does all this, you'll be amazed. Luke 6, verse 27 says this. Listen to it. It's hard to read. It's hard to read. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. What does do good mean? Bless them. Bless them. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. That's what Jesus said. Boy, that's hard to do, isn't it? That's difficult, difficult to do. Let me tell you what challenge I'm right in the middle of right now. I'm going to just be totally honest with you, all right? I am right in the middle of this right here. Let me say this first before I get too clean about it. First, 
You have to forgive yourself. There are people sitting here, right here, that, that say, I know God can forgive me because God can forgive anything. But you can't forgive yourself. You've got to forgive yourself. Look, you may not have had all the information. Uh, you may have reacted uh, before you were saved. You were lost. You may not have had the right knowledge, skill. Uh, I mean, it could have caught you by... Uh, there's just a thousand things that could have happened to you that, 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 did, that made you uh, fall into this issue that you have going on. Somebody did it to you. You had no choice about it. You were the victim and not the perpetrator. Forgive, give yourself a little mercy. God gives you mercy. You, you give yourself a little mercy. How about it? Do you know that some of the greatest ministry that ever happens in life happens from people that have been hurt the worst? It's like these scars that we have in our, in our emotions. God uses them to witness to other people because nobody can help somebody that has a certain scar like the person who has the same scar right here. And God has helped. And then you got to forgive that other person, whoever it might be, who, however they were involved, and all those kind of things. Because God says, if you're going to get healed, you're going to have to love your enemies. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to uh, do good to those who hate you. And you're going to have to pray for those who spitefully use you. And here's my challenge, and I'm telling you, here's where I am right now. Something happened to me about 10 years ago. Terrible thing. Terrible thing. I'm still mad right now about it. Been mad for 10 years. Still mad right now. You know what God told me when I was preparing this message? You got to get over this. That's what he said. You got to get over this. And he said, you are going to have to pray for them to be blessed. You're going to have to ask me to bless them. And I said, I am not going to do it. Because if I pray and ask you to bless them and you actually bless them, I'm going to be mad at you. Because they don't deserve any blessing. They deserve punishment and torture. And I've got them in a little torture chamber in my hurt locker. And I open the door every once in a while and bring them out and box on them. And, and I give them a little bit. Put them right back in that hurt locker. God says, if you are going to be healed from that anger and hostility you have in you, you are going to have to pray for them to be blessed. And so, you know what I've started doing the last three days? That's how fresh this is. The last three days, I've crossed my fingers. And I've said, Lord, bless them for what they've done. If, if, if you think you have to, I have my fingers crossed. But I'm telling you, you know what I'm finding? I'm, I'm finding that the more I pray for them, the, the easier it gets. The more, the more I, I mean, here's what he said. He said, no, 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 no I, you laugh about these fingers crossed, but I promise you I did it. And, and uh, I mean, that's not just a joke, but, uh, and, but he said, you know, you're going to have to uncross those fingers. You're going to have to, you can't be, can't be half-hearted. He said, I'm talking about you pray for them to be blessed just like you pray for yourself to be blessed. I said, I can't do it because I deserve it and they don't. He said, it's got to be. Now, I'm telling you, I'm going to keep on praying for them every day. Every day I'm seeing their face. I'm praying God bless them, help them, minister them, Move in their life. Make life better for them, Lord. Make life easier for them. May their life be filled with abundance. And you don't think that's difficult to do. Just give it a shot and mean it. Oh, I'm still, I'm still on, I'm still on, I don't know if I really mean it or not, but, but, but I'm, I'm doing it, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you a report. I'm going to give you a report over the next few weeks and let you know how it's going. 
because I do it every day. And I'm telling you, in the three or four days that I've been doing it so far, I'm finding I'm, I'm beginning to be released a little bit from this. And I'm saying that unless you can pray for them to be blessed, you have not forgiven them. If you can't pray for them to be blessed like you are blessed, you are not forgiving them. So there you go. Deal with that. All right, stand to your feet. Will you?